Hello everyone, greetings from uh, Denmark. Thank you very much for attending. My name is Spiridon and I'm heading the DevSecOps Center of Excellence at Danske Bank. I'm here today to talk to you about site reliability engineering adoptions and give you some tips on what I consider are the fundamentals um, in, in your SRE journey. So actually getting started with it. A little bit on the agenda, I will touch upon what's the origin of the concepts and what is uh, its essence, in, in my opinion. And then I'm going to cover five fundamentals, starting with the tenets and, and balance, going to topologies, frameworks, reconciliation with traditional IT service management, and, and lastly, team composition. I will conclude the session with some lessons learned that I have learned myself out of my experience with the concept. Um, make sure that I'm going to leave enough time uh, for your questions at the end. So getting directly into, uh, into it, its origin uh, is backdated in 2003 and comes from Google. Um, the most mainstream definition is the one that comes from Ben Trainer, who is the VP of engineering at Google, and you could call it the father of, of SRB. And basically he describes the concept as fundamentally what happens when you get a software engineer to design an operations function. So basically, from this definition, we can derive that the course primarily has to do with operations, but it has to do also a lot with engineering and, and being embedded into the software development lifecycle. Uh, now, there are many different definitions of SRE, and people can shape it the, the way they want and, and define its essence. But in, in my opinion, it is prescriptive ways on measuring and achieving in, uh, reliability through engineering and operations work. Um, and basically, if you take the acronym and you read it backwards, uh, you get engineering the reliability of the service. So basically, it's several actions, frameworks, patterns, ways, methods you use in order to make sure that you have reliable services. Now, looking a little bit into the, the, the big debate on what's the relation between SRE and DevOps, um, this is actually a statement coming from Google that classes SRE implements DevOps. And it's actually something that I personally believe on. So basically, SRE uh, should be seen as a discipline um, in order to, to, to enable a broader DevOps adoption in uh, your organization. Now, going into the frameworks, uh, there is this term in, 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 in Google SRE that is called Tenet. Um, and basically, the definition is that it's a, a basic and common set of responsibilities across SRE teams. So basically, what are the tasks uh, and responsibilities of, uh, of uh, the several SRE teams in your organization that are common, actually. Um, and then a second um, term is actually what is called the SRE balance. So basically, the idea is that your site reliability engineering team is going to be spending 50% of their time uh, doing operations work, while the rest of 50% will go on improvements. Here on this uh, diagram, I have made an attempt to define or list the tenets the way that I have use them in, in my experience. I know they're a little bit different uh, to what you're going to find in the Google publications, but this actually is the essence of the concept that you, you make what you want out of it and, and you define the way you wish. So basically, when we talk about operations, uh, an SRE team typically will be doing emergency response, uh, which is actually a response into what we call in the industry level one. So incidents in the application or the infrastructure that is being uh, uh, supported and the first level reaction. And ideally, this first level reaction is actually um, the level one, while there is a level zero before that, that it comes out of the improvements part, which level zero, it's your infrastructure and application try to self heal itself and, and come into life. If it doesn't succeed on that, then you get into the level one, which is your SREs taking action. There are a lot of stuff on observability, and basically that goes on monitoring and logging um, in your application and infrastructure stack. Post-mortems, in case that you do have incidents that you need to do some root cause analysis and, and appoint preventives in, in order to ensure that they won't happen again. Release management and deployment uh, work, as well as service continuity to make sure that in case you have a disastrous event, you don't lose your service and you continue having operations. Now, on smoothening these operations and shift towards what I call operations engineering, there's the latter 50% of improvements that the necessary team will work on. And, that is primarily on eliminating toil, and toil in Google terms means manual, repetitive, and automatable tasks to basically make sure that you can have as autonomous operations and hands off as possible. Several actions in order to improve the reliability uh, of a service. Actions on measuring and reducing technical debt. So basically, you make sure that 
your uh, error budget, for instance, stay where it should be, and that happens in a proactive way. Uh, work around proactive capacity management. So looking into your historical data or looking into the intended growth and, and, and predict what the, the, how your application should scale and, and, and take preventive actions. And then a lot of stuff around release engineering. And basically this is looking into, let's put it so simplified, release management process front to back and the engineering steps of it that you have uh, implemented in your CSD pipeline, your IT service management tool, your infrastructure platforms, and basically make sure that you can balance uh, release velocity with reliability. So you can go as fast as you want, but make sure that you don't damage reliability. There is another definition of SRE from Google that it says is what happens when you have a car running with 120 kilometers per hour and you change the tires on the fly. That gives you a good essence of what release engineering means in, 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 in SRE terms. And then there is a lot of transformation initiatives so that the necessary team can spend their time on as part of the improvements. And one example that I've typically seen is, is working on transforming your application uh, into cloud native. Um, now, in the long run, this percentage, of course, is not prescriptive. What Google wants to, to say and the concept wants to say is that you should not be spending more than 50% on operations. And it, it depends a lot with where is your life cycle of your service at the current moment. Is it still early deployments, you're in canary releases phase, or do you have a mature product that is in production? Eventually, in the long run, and that's just the indication that I've seen from my own experience, you would like to minimize operations into 20%, and then 80% will go on improvements, and ideally into transformation initiatives. Now, why this is a very important framework, uh, and fundamental of SRE is defining the balance and defining the tenets is actually very important because in essence, you explain what you want to make out of it. So basically, what will be the responsibility of the SRE team and what is going to be its operating model? It's actually derived by the objectives you want to achieve with uh, implementing the concept. Now, a second fundamental and very important is topologies. And there are several combinations on how you can organize your SRE teams. I've, I've brought only two here, but you can sense and probably have experienced way more than that. Um, and one very important thing is that you need to reconcile this topology with your broader DevOps operating model ecosystem. So you need to embed it into the current DevOps model you have, or if you are in the phase of evolving it, you need to evolve the SRE topology together with it. So basically the first one, I call it embedded slash organic, and this is full ownership. I've brought an example here from uh, the financial service industry when I'm coming from and the FRTB, which is a regulatory uh, legislation from financial services on the trading domain. And basically, in order to implement that regulatory framework, you need to have certain products come into play where they have dependencies. Um, um, and actually, you need to orchestrate everything around them. So basically, one idea is that you take ecosystems, like the FRTB in this case, and then embed tactically your SRE people into the different applications where they have dependencies, and actually help them to harmonize uh, to the best possible extent how this ecosystem operates from a site reliability engineering perspective. This is important because it can give you a higher return of investment. The more the scale, the bigger the return of the investment. It can help you to harmonize and orchestrate within your ecosystem, but also it can make sure that you can have a lot of good mechanisms of error handling. So basically, uh, it is the, 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 the one rotten apple in the bucket of apples uh, scenario that if you have one rotten apple, it's just a matter of, of, of time for the rest to get rotten. And the same goes on a reliability concept. If you just focus on reliability of a single application and you don't look into the peripherals, it's just a matter of time that they're going to break you. So basically looking into ecosystems, tactically placing the people and get them to harmonize as much as possible across tenets and, 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 uh, and the methodology of, of doing things. Um, and then it's very important that when you have your core infrastructure, that you have the most technological utilities consumed and the biggest volume of clients, you also do tactically embed site reliability engineering. And two examples that I can bring here that I've seen in my experience paying a lot of is, for instance, your container platform or your CICD pipeline or your enterprise message bus. So basically making sure that your core foundation is also aligned with the reliability practices of the application layer. Now, a second model, it is what I call task force. And basically, this is come stabilize, transfer knowledge, and move on. Um, and this is on applications that don't really have a big dependency. They have an indirect one, but not direct one. And for the ones in the FSI industry, you can see core payments and equity trading. They do have a dependency, but it's not a direct connection. 
Um, and then do have a center of excellence, so call it as you wish. Basically, it's going to be SRE squads that they step in into a situation that you do have reliability and efficiency problems. They do support on resolving those, do knowledge transfer in the respective teams, and they basically go back into the COE and either work into central SRE incubation programs, for example, or move to the next engagement to, to call it that way. Now, it is very important actually that you have, uh, as, as I mentioned, these topologies uh, aligned with your overall DevOps operating model and you're becoming very creative based on your objectives on, on what you want to achieve. A fundamental number three is frameworks. And if you remember from the essence definition I gave, I talked about prescriptive. Prescriptive in, in, in these terms means legally established and accepted. And basically you need to be consistent across your SRA ecosystem on the way you do things. There are several frameworks that are gonna be very important for you in, in your journey. I've brought only four of them here. The one is observability. So basically it can help you with visibility of your health status, get alerted um, uh, well in advance, become very proactive, use the data to do chaos engineering and stress test your system in close to real circumstances, but also collect data to do capacity planning. Then a second very important framework is to achieve autonomous IT service management. And basically this is getting the technologies that consist of your IT service management hooked up and interoperated with your release engineering and actually make it as event driven and autonomous as possible. So basically people just, it's this, it's this term I'm using, people just drinking coffee and looking to screens while the tools using APIs and events take care of the whole world. For instance, a great example here is reconciling your whole release management, deployment management, incident problem, change management, service, manage, service level management mechanisms um, together. The third one, a very important, which is actually the backbone, uh, in my opinion, is release engineering. So basically, find the right balance of controls and innovation in order to make sure that you have an equilibrium between release velocity and reliability. Look into CICD orchestration tactics. Uh, and very importantly, especially for regulatory industries like the one I'm coming from, enable a compliance as code. Uh, framework uh, where basically you do prove it in an evident way that you are compliant with your regulatory requirements um, in an automatic way without slowing down your application while ensuring compliance, security, and reliability. A fourth very important mechanism, which I've seen extremely, extremely valuable uh, in, in, in my uh, experience with the concept, is the production readiness review. So, this is basically a checklist that defines functional and non functional as well as organizational and governance uh, items that you need to be compliant with in order to make sure that the service you move into production, it fulfills certain criteria from a reliability perspective. And this is actually the gatekeeping mechanism of SRE uh, in order to take over a service in production or take over new releases uh, in production. That can ensure a coalition understanding of what needs to be done across IT, business, infrastructure, your legal departments as well, and compliance, or what are the prerequisites in order to have a, a, a compliant and reliable system in production, as well as to give you guidelines on what you need to take care of across your SDLC before you can classify a service as, as ready to be operated. So again, this is not exhaustive. Uh, I have picked up the four frameworks that I see more vital. And as I mentioned, it's very important that you make them prescriptive so people buy in and they see them as mandatory and that you're consistent on using them across your uh, site reliability engineering adoption uh, because they're going to also help you to replicate your success and actually give pre-made recipes to people that can get fastly onboarded uh, into the concept. Now, next one, and actually this is one of the, of the biggest problems uh, that people see with SRE. So SRE, it's baptized to be Google's ITSM, IT service management uh, flavor. And if we look into the industry around IT service management, the dominant uh, framework is ITIL, the IT infrastructure library. And most organizations are starting adopting this one before DevOps and before SRD. And then it becomes a religious discussion that do they come into conflict? How can they play ball with each other? Are we gonna just screw up all the good work we have done for, for ITIL um, and so on? In, in essence, in reality, and for the ones that have practiced both and they can have reconciled both, I consider myself be one, one of them, it's not a conflictual relation. And if it is becoming conflictual, it's because you force it doing it. And that is primarily due to organizational behavior aspects that I'm not gonna go through it um, in this session. 
but please do not make it look uh, conflictual or be enabled as conflictual. The easiest way I'm using myself to explain to people how they can do the reconciliation, and, and here I have some examples, is I'm listing, you can see here, some processes and services under IT infrastructure library. And then the way I explain it is that this process can give you a definition of what the processes are and can give you governance. So basically demarcation, a process design, full life cycle. Where SRE reading comes into picture is that it gives you the process engineering capabilities. And I know now I, I describe it very simplistically. Uh, in, in reality, it's a little bit more sophisticated, but it's a very good mechanism to explain to people how this can happen. So what I have done now in this screen, I've taken five vital processes and five SRE tenets, and I've done them one to one model. So basically, your problem management in ITIL is exactly the same with the postmortems in the SRE world, with a little bit more changes on the engineering mechanism around it in the culture. Your release management is the corresponding release engineering in the SRE world. So basically, you have a release management process. How do we simplify it and re-engineer it, release engineer it, in essence, is very descriptive as a term. Service level management can be implemented through the SLOs, SLIs, mean time to recover, and the error budget mechanism. Your service transition phase definitely needs a production readiness review. I know in ITAL it's called operational readiness review, and it's very similar. While in the production readiness review, there's more engineering feeling on, on the way you collect data and what you're looking for. Uh, and then basically service continuity can be tested and enabled through kills engineering practices of, of SRB. Now, what is very important actually is to do this reconciliation, do the mapping, and actually keep doing the reconciliation as both the concepts evolve and your overall adoption of both is evolving and then to fit them into your broader devops operating model because they need to also come into play with other devops aspects that are not it service management and, and, and only focused so if you haven't done this exercise i propose to you that you do it and you're going to find it really intuitive um, and 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 that the one concept come to to, to complement the other in uh, in reality now, fundamental number four is your team composition. Uh, and actually, it's a very tricky quest to, to resolve what are the profiles I need. And, and that it's a rather creative one. Um, inevitably, you need to start with what are your objectives, right? Uh, not every service needs an SRE team, and not every service needs the same SRE team because this business context, functional, no functional requirements, service lifecycle, compliance, that actually play a key role on what profiles you need. Whatever your context, uh, everyone in the SRE team needs to have an engineering background and everyone should be able to code. What I have listed here is quite of a complete profile set of what you would look for uh, in order to have the ideal composition. But that again depends, as I mentioned, on your, uh, on your context. So basically, definitely you need a software engineer, definitely you need QA engineering, definitely you need cloud nativeness and infrastructure engineering if you're already or you're going towards infrastructure as code and the users of, of public cloud services the the right composition i've seen myself is three to four of these profiles that actually can rotate also within the team when needed so you have a primary and secondary in its tenet or discipline the way you organize it um, and the magic number is seven so seven people with one tech lead and there's some very good publications from google why it's important to have a tech lead in, in your rest of the team um, it is the ideal uh, combination. Now, it's obvious we talk about these eight profiles, and then basically capability and skill set mapping will be very handy in order to rank profiles horizontally on how much in broadness they need to understand, but also vertically on how much in depth they should be going in certain concepts. Most probably, you're going to have certain people with full focus and, and expertise, for instance, on release engineering, while others they have the same on observability while others, they have a more focus on QA security compliance. It's up to you actually to define it based on, on what you want to achieve. So this is a little bit out of the fundamentals. And, and I have some lessons learned here. I've learned them the hard way. Uh, I have a lot of romantic stories implementing SRE and in, in, in the very early days and when the concept uh, became available uh, in 2016 and people started talking and using it. And, and I brought here a sample of them. So. It's very important to have responsibly lazy people. I don't know if that's a term, but I'm using it myself. So basically, your SRE should be lazy, 
but also be very responsible. So lazy in this case means that they don't want to do manual things. They don't want to take calls at midnight and they're going to make sure that they take pre preventive and proactive actions to avoid that. Can I give you a very romantic story? That was my, the first SME team that I've ever built. And if they're here now, I'm sure they're going to smile. We were lucky enough that when we got started and in the first six to nine months, most of them were either already had very young kids or their wives were giving birth. So basically, they had many reasons to wake up at night. And the last thing they wanted is to wake up at night because we had an incident. So basically, they've done a great work in order to build very reliable systems from the ground with reliability built in by design to make sure that they won't be called at night. And this is a true story, actually. It's lacked by coincidence. Now, don't sell it only as automation. I've seen that in many places. Uh, for, some, for some reason, people have difficulty to explain what site reliability engineering is. And primarily, and it's very descriptive from its name, actually, as I mentioned in the first slide, especially if you read it backwards. So for many reasons, they just call it and baptize it as automation, which is a fallacy because automation and the elimination of toil is only one of the tenets. So don't get started and call it automation because you're going to lose the essence of what you want to make out of it. You're going to get people lost in the way of what this is really about. And also you're going to have issue by, to, to, to create um, a team skill set that is really fitting your uh, objectives. Now, safety to the extreme left. And basically, that goes not just from the first commit or the first requirement uh, written. It goes from the ideation phase. So safety totally left in the US DLC. Don't force people into the role. Um, and if we talk about uh, a talk that everyone is to have an engineering background, everyone should be able to code. There's some people that they prefer coding and they don't like the operations aspect of, of things. Don't try to force them into the operation role because it, it won't be good neither for you nor for the service. Uh, find people that they voluntarily want to take this role and that they enjoy to go back and forth into the uh, STLC. Lesson learned number five, difficult to, to attract. We all have the same problem. We've all been there. We all are there and we're going to be there. So basically try to find candidates internally uh, and incubate them into the role. It's going to be very difficult to find the amount and quality of SLAs you want out there. Number six, do the math. You can do a lot of mathematics on release engineering, error budgets, capacity management, chaos engineering. Do the math, collect baselines, compare how you improve so you can demonstrate success. Uh, use real mathematical formulas, write them yourself, so decide what's in the equation and what is not. Um, now, something that is very relevant to the financial service industry where I'm coming from, make sure that your segregation of duty policies is SRE friendly. I've seen a lot of SOD policies in my career that they built walls between development and operations, making the SRE implementation impossible. So make sure that your segregation of duty policies is SRE friendly. And then last but not least, reconcile, reconcile, and reconcile. Reconcile it with your IT service management methodology, with your software development life cycle, with your DevOps adoption, with any capability that comes into play in order to enable the concept. So actually, this is what I had. I would like to thank you for attending. Reach out on LinkedIn uh, if you want to discuss further and exchange experiences. And I have listed down there a, a very, very nice lineup of publications that I found very inspirational myself and I do recommend you uh, to read. Thank you very much for attending and, and hopefully talk to you on LinkedIn. Goodbye. Hello, everyone now live uh sergey that is a very good question that was me uh forgetting to change the the the, the, the title of, of the slide actually i did a little bit of grooming and i forgot about the title but i can give you actually 18 or 20 lessons learned if you wish um so that was just a typo only one lesson learned that i haven't put uh actually um, is to uh, do the mathematics on, on the investment to incubate people. Um, in certain cases, it's going to be a lot of investment for internal trainings, outside training, certifications. And when, when organizations discover what the cost about it is, they withdraw a little bit. Another lesson learned is that bring your business partners with you, product owners, business directors, get them to understand what the value proposition is. So there's many more than the ones outlined some context of the shift lift testing aspect yeah very much correct so basically it's ha happily enough we had a similar session at work today so we're creating new devops playbook model um so actually shifting testing aspect left is start with uh, designing your application 
So basically, the patterns and standards and guidelines that you use to design your application should take both functional and non-functional requirements into account. And there's functional testing like unit testing, regression testing, UIT, and then you have the whole non-functional performance, uh, reliability, and, and so on. So basically, when designing your application and outlining your requirements, it's very important from the very early days to, to take these aspects into account and look how you can, for instance, use your CICD pipeline to achieve that, what your test plans will be, what test environments you need, what test data you need, uh, look into potentially mocking interfaces for integration tests and, and so on. Um, and then basically, it is, uh, it is a fine balance between having the capabilities you need on demand so have a test automation framework, for instance, that is fully hooked up to your CICD pipeline. And then basically that can be used to trigger any, any level of test. Then take that test automation framework and, and actually have it, the more you shift to the right, the slimmer it becomes because you start with something very heavy on your CI and then you can use subset in order to, or as, as, as you go to your CD side, um, which you can also use for chaos engineering practices. So one of the practices to use regression test cases or performance load test cases for case engineering. Also, you can use some of these test cases for disaster recovery, which is an exercise that you go down. In most of the cases, if you don't have a pre-production environment, which is a replica of production, it's going to happen in your production environment. So basically, summarizing it without becoming very lengthy, it's very important that once you build it in by, by design, and if your application is already there and you don't build it at the moment, it's good to collect data from production because production tells you the truth. And then through the whole problem management and everything, enrich your quality assurance capability sitting left. Great. Uh, how would SREs come into play if they are more on the postmodern? No, they are not, actually. And this is one of the messages that I want to pass. So in my humble opinion, of course, and you can adopt SRE and, and, and DevOps in, in, in different flavors, right? Uh, the SREs are not entering the game in production. The SREs are entering the game from the continuous design and development, I call it. So they do have the same backlog with the developers. Maybe it's the same person, actually, the developer and the SRE. Uh, they do have a saying on the prioritization. They do uh, meet the product owner when the backlog grooming and prioritization takes place. Um, so basically, it's not that they're going to get involved only when something goes wrong in, in production. This is a little bit of, I don't know how to call it, I use some weird terms to describe things to people, but this is a little bit of engineering traditional operations. While SRE actually is really getting the people together with the process shifting left in the SDLC. Um, and then you can have, if it's a different people and it's not the same one, so if you have developers and SRE, in, I've seen both a developer being SRE at the same time in the rotational mode. But also have seen five developers and one SRE taking care of the service the five developers um, deliver. So your whole topology, as I talked about the fundamental number two, how you organize is super important. That will also give you a taste on how much left your, your SRE team is, is shifting. Uh... Well, actually, Mike, uh, not, definitely there must be something from the Linux Foundation. I mean, the community is, is, is huge. Uh, I primarily use my own network, which I actually built out of conferences and, and, and vendors that I work with in my, um, uh, in my professional life. Uh, public cloud services and CSD uh, vendors and container vendors. Um, but I'm certain there's something on the Linux Foundation around this area that I haven't discovered myself yet. More questions, you can you can go as broad as you want and, and, and go f way far from the material I presented. Uh, depends, David. So basically, definitely you will expect the service to, to know scripting. And I, I distinguish between scripting and programming, at least myself. So scripting is BAS, is Python, is uh, Ansible. So basically, this is languages that help you to achieve operational efficiencies, I call them. Programming is something that you develop in order to build business logic, and that can be .NET, Java, C Sharp, and so on. Uh, it is definitely mandatory that your SREs can script because uh, a lot of the toil elimination and observability and release engineering stuff is pure scripting, actually. Now, when it comes to hardcore, biz, hardcore business logic programming, to be a little bit more academic, um, again, it depends on, on your topology and the tenets you defined. 
So basically, if you're if you if you have a rotational mode, then it's the developer, so they know what to they, they know how to code. If it is a more of a, a, a fixed role setup, n number of developers, n minus one the surveys, and um, then basically depending, as I mentioned before, on how left you shift them in in the pipeline. You might have a setup that your your SRE does scripting, but they don't do programming, but they are taking care of the whole uh, QA framework. So they do um, programming when it comes to interoperating test automation frameworks and stuff. Um, or you can do a lot of programming to build a very solid observability framework. Actually, David is gonna stay blurry forever because it really depends on, on what you wanna make out of it. Uh, the most difficult challenge is the company. Yeah, I, I can tell you, and I hope, I'm not sure if my current colleagues are here, but definitely colleagues from elsewhere, they will uh, relate. It is, it is difficult to explain to people what it is about and explain them mostly why it's not coming into conflict with DevOps and why it's not coming into conflict with uh, ITIL. Uh, the biggest difficulty that I had, and I can tell you my romantic story, the first SRE adoption I've done some years ago, it was behind the scenes. It was backed up by my CIO in the, in the top management. It was driven by a regulatory, heavy regulatory project. But it happened behind the scenes because initially we did fail to explain to people that, guys, SRE is going to come and complement ITIL and, and DevOps. We're not going to come and bombard what has already happened. And, and in my experience, it's easier not to talk a lot about it and then when you have the success stories and you have done this reconciliation in a small setup and you've proven that you managed to fit this into the broader context, then become more vocal about it because then people can see something real and it's not PowerPoint slides or fairy tales from um, a tech giant, actually. And then transitioning from pre-SRE practices using SRE uh that's actually i hope i'm a little bit I'm a little bit bold on that one um so basically some of the old i mean one of the difficulties that i've seen myself is to transform old itsm people which is just process owners and process designers of lengthy incident management process with 29 steps um to get them to understand that we don't need 20 out of these nine steps maybe 25 out of these nine steps um, so basically, a little bit of people that um, don't have exposure to DevOps to begin with, because in my opinion, in order to go SRE, you need to have a DevOps foundation, a very solid one. Getting people, so an idea is Agile, ITSM, DevOps, SRE. Getting people from here to here directly is, is pretty difficult. It, close to impossible, actually, if I'm to be frank. Um, also because let's not hide behind our fingers, this organizational behavior aspects that don't want SRE to succeed, because and I can talk openly, there's no, no problem with that. A, a successful SRE adoption minimizes the manual interventions and hands you need to run services. And that in some companies will result to rethinking about the people baseline. Um, so if we go a little bit into organizational aspects, this a little bit more dark motives than only um, straightforward ones. You're welcome. Thank you very much for asking. What advice will you give when having post Because sometimes I can. Correct. So basically, uh, I, I call it, uh, I use the term solidarity uh, in myself. And it comes from the old days when I started implementing DevOps. And basically, I was trying to, to, to get closer with my partners uh, on, on the development side and operations. Basically, I was talking about DevOps solidarity. Uh, and, and basically, you need to embed to people that we need to show solidarity. And it's all about using the right wording, in my opinion. So definitely, definitely, if one area has done something wrong, it is, you, you, you will have to blame them, right? But use the right wording and the right attitude. So don't point a figure, don't say you. Say our partners in infrastructure, not the infrastructure guys. So basically, when we look into what went wrong, definitely you got to, it has a, a necessary blame in it. But it's all about the culture, how close you work with these teams, uh, and the wording and, and, and attitude that you got to use. 
And essentially, to make SRE happen uh, as any other concept that is a little bit radical, you need to make friends in the organization. So it also depends on the level of friendship you have across areas, um, which is on the soft side of things. So it needs a little bit of emotional intelligence, actually, um, as, as any other concept that's a little bit radical to the mainstream ways of, of companies running. All right, I can see from Colleen that we are out of time, actually. Um, thank you very much for attending. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I'll be more than happy to connect on LinkedIn and, and have a virtual coffee and discuss more on the concept. Have a good afternoon, night, day, wherever you are. Thank you very much.